So a little bit about our division. Um, I'm going to give you um, what we're going to go over tonight. We're going to do an over, uh, overview of our division. We're going to talk about some recycling and waste reduction programs that we have started um, recently in the last year or so and how they are doing and how to um, participate. Um, our food recovery in our in our school lunch programs, um, some of our school outdoor beautification projects that we have started this year, and our green school program. Next slide, please. So the quick overview of, of our division is um, we're here to make sure that every decision, everything we do incorporate through MCPS is all thought with sustainability in mind. Um, we want to make sure every decision that MCPS makes um, and every consideration that they do is all aimed towards a healthy and cleaning environment um, for our students and our staff. Um, so some things that we cover is energy and utilities. Um, so that's energy uh, waste reduction. So um, the energy uh, waste, um, water waste, stuff like that. Um, also, you know, it covers our solar panels, our EV um, uh, projects, and a lot of other projects. Um, school uh, recycling team, energy and recycling teams. When we go out to schools, we do outreach with our students. Um, we take care of recycling. We also look at our our energy bills and uh, what are our building and what our students are consuming in energy and try to, um, you know, bring that down. Um, environmental compliance covers um, clean air, um, water, lead in the water, stuff like that. Um, fire code, indoor air quality. Um, so we're making sure that our students are safe um, with everything we do. We're complying with everything environmental in our school, that paint, asbestos, everything like that. That all falls under our department and much more. Next slide. So in 2000, I'm sorry, 2022 and June 28th, MCPS um, put out a policy, uh, sustainability policy, ECA. Um, this policy is an overreaching policy. This policy is going to actually touch every decision that we make in um, MCPS um, from the, the smallest thing of what we're, you know, what products we're buying to what food we're ordering um, to the biggest sustainability project is our construction project, how are we building schools more sustainable. Um, this also in lines with the climate action plan the county put out. Um, so by we want to cut our greenhouse emissions by 80% by 2027 and 100% by 2025 compared to our 2005 levels. Um, we're doing very well, we think, um, as we're going. We have a lot of work to do yet. It's a pretty lofty goal. It's a pretty, um, it's a very, a very lofty goal. But, um, you know, we're going to set the bar high um, for our students. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to talk to you tonight is a little bit of our recycling, our waste reduction that we've been doing this year. Um, we, we have a, um, a lot of different programs we've been recycling um, in our county for a very long time. Um, is mandatory in our county to recycle, is mandatory in our schools to recycle. Um, all schools have to have a recycling plan. Um, this is mandatory by MCPS. Um, so, um, but we've done every time we do recycling, it's always changing. We're always looking for new ways to do it. We're constantly looking for new things to recycle or, or, or change ways we do things. Um, so for a little example is Chromebooks. Chromebooks is a new thing. That all of our students have Chromebooks. Well, instead of like getting each in the world of Chromebook mailed to us and with all the stuff in it, we told them that we don't want any of the extra CDs and all that stuff like that. We don't need them all for every single Chromebook. Um, and we don't need all the extra wires. We don't need them individually boxed. So they're sending them in a box of 10 with just enough to set up one. And then we can just use that over and over again to set up all the rest of them. So these are the kind of some of the things that we look at as times change, the different ways that we can recycle um, in our, in our uh, school system. Next slide, please. So here are some of the new things that we started just last year. Um, obviously we were looking around at different things to do and glue sticks and pens and markers. Um, use ink cartridges and some single-use batteries. Uh, these are the things that we use a lot of in school. Um, they weren't recycled by Montgomery County. So these are things that we said, all right, well, we're going to find other programs that we can uh, set off and recycle them. So these are just a few of the things that we, um, that we said, all right, well, let's find things that our schools are using heavily um, and find ways to recycle them. Can you go to the next slide real quick? 
So as you see that bag all the way to the right, that is what we collected last year in markers alone. It's over 9,000 markers that we collected last year from the schools um, that were dried up and not usable anymore, and we got them recycled. Um, so that kept that all out of the trash. Um, that's a lot of markers. That was our first year doing it. So you know we don't think that all schools participated um, and we'll figure we'll get a lot more this year. Um, we did actually didn't even introduce it to March of, the, of last year's school year. So we were a little behind. The second picture is um, a boxes of um, glue sticks. Um, glue sticks don't weigh very much. So when I say it's only about, it's only about 400 something pounds, it's actually a lot of glue sticks because you know they, they weigh uh, so little, uh, 400 pounds is a lot. Um, and the third picture is um, Cold Springs Elementary School. So what they did is after the Christmas rush, they asked all their kids to bring in their batteries and their old toys and all the stuff that they got for Christmas. And they did 186 pounds in the month of December. Um, so that took 186 uh, pounds of batteries out of, this, um, of the waste stream. If you look at the fourth picture, that's what my office looks like usually. Um, so we asked um, the schools to save to save money. Um, instead of putting each individual box in a school, we actually take a used box at the school, package it up, send it back to us, and then we'll just keep the um, the large uh, boxes here instead of putting zero waste boxes in every school and have to pick them up at each school. We have them all just shipped right here through our pony system. It's a, uh, a mailing system, uh, inter-office mailing system through the schools that we already have set up. So they do come here every day. So they just have to put it in there and get directly to my office. And then we you know stack it up and then we, uh, we weigh it and distribute it and, and send it where it has to go. Next, Frank. So just a little bit about, um, about us too is that the county says that we have to recycle paper, commingle as plastics or biometals, um, yard waste, and um, some construction materials. So we only have to recycle them for, but these are all the other things that we decide. And this list is probably a little bit bigger now. It grows constantly. Um, some of the other things that we do, the antifreeze from our buses, the um, our automotive batteries, all our construction projects. It's amazing that we tore down a school, um, a high school, um, last year, and we, or it was the year before, and we recycled 92% of that school. So 92% of that school got recycled or reused. We do take fixtures and stuff like that that are still good that we can be used in other schools. We, we take them out of the school um, and we reuse them in other schools. We store them for um, use from another time. After that, um, we send everything to recycling. So the only things that we didn't really recycle are stuff that, you know, is just not a recycle or product anywhere um, would, would have to go to the thing. But so 92% um, is pretty good. We're averaging about all our construction projects. We did six this year uh, and about 85% of our construction projects are totally recycled. Um, we also do our, you know, vegetable oils and our motor oils from our buses, um, you know, fill dirt, like I said, glue sticks, lamps, um, anything you really think of that we can recycle. Um, we try to recycle it. A lot of these um, these things you see on here are just um, grouped together with a lot of other things. Um, like when we say, you know, building construction material, that's probably about 30 different things that we're actually recycling, but we just put it under construction. Um, so we do actually recycle as much as we can here at MCPS. Um, we probably lead the way of, of any school system in Maryland and pretty much across the United States. If we compare it to a lot of school systems, we are way ahead of the game of, of what we recycle. Next slide, please. So here's our new program. This is the program we started um, last year. We had 40 pilot uh, programs. We're gonna introduce it to all schools this year. It's food waste diversion program. Um, so basically um, what we did, we were noticing at school, kids don't eat all their lunch. Sometimes they don't eat lunch at all. You know, this is, they have about 20 minutes to eat. This is their opportunity to hang out with their friends that are not in their class. That might be their best friends in their neighborhood. And sometimes, you know, we want them to eat, but sometimes they don't, or they just over, over chew stuff or whatever each day. Um, so we looked at this and we started figuring out uh, what we wanted to do, uh, why we have so much food waste, what can we do with this food waste? So we started crunching some numbers and we did a waste survey in 2009. It's quite old, but um, it said 26% of our waste was food waste. So we, we took that by today's numbers um, about because our enrollment forces went up and stuff like that. We took that by today's numbers and we figured about if we take 5% recover, which is a very low number, we only recover 5% of that 26%. That's 255 tons of food a year, which feed about 1,900 students a day. Um, so, is, so we really want to roll these programs out. You go to the next slide. 
So what we do is we provide each school with a refrigerator with a glass door for the kids to open it a thousand times and waste energy <laughs> looking and see what they want. Um, we have a food safe cart that we put it on. Um, so what basically um, is is taking the spot of traditional share table. Um, so a share table, kids were putting milk and stuff on the, um, you know, just on a table. And um, that's just not the way we want to do it um, with the cheese sticks. They should be refrigerated at all times. So they should come out and be immediately refrigerated if they're not going to be eaten. So we offer this refrigerator. Um, go to the next slide, Jim Carlos, please. We also offer is this cart. So we got rid of the, um, the, end, the share table because we feel like it doesn't work. So at the end of each lunch period, say it's a, a, a motor school, for example, they have three lunches. At that third lunch, whoever puts stuff on the share table, no one gets to take it after that because the, you know, the doors get closed, the lunchroom gets locked, it all gets cleaned up. So we decided to use a cart. We put that cart in other places in, in the school after lunch for, uh, we look at our food shy students that you know, don't want to take food in front of their friends or are nervous to do it. Um, they can still participate in the program. Uh, after school activities, this is a great thing for after school activities. Um, a lot of these kids eat lunch at 11 o'clock, a lot of these students, um, and their parents don't pick them up to six. And sometimes their daycares give them a granola bar and a small thing of juice. Um, sometimes just not enough um, for these students. Um, so when we start this program, we thought about, all right, what happens if we have a lot of food left over after, after this? What are we going to do with it? We don't want to throw it away either. So we partnered with um, Mama Foods and a student nonprofit. We have a student, um, Montgomery, Richard Montgomery student, who has a, a, um, she has her own uh, nonprofit, and she delivers food to um, the homeless shelters and also to uh, Interfaith Works. Unfortunately, last year, we had zero donations at all 40 schools. Um, every time we talk to a school, they say, by Friday, the food is gone, which is excellent. We're, we love to see that. So um, all 40 of our schools that did it last year said that, you know, no problem with the cart being in the hallway. No one's bothering it. But by Friday, everything is empty. Um, she says it's usually daily it's empty. Um, but, you know, there's some things that they don't, you know, don't, even the stuff that you don't think they want to eat. Carrot sticks was a big thing. Um a lot of students didn't want to eat the bags of carrots, but um, kindergarten teachers came down and brought them back for snacks and put them in a different environment. Now they wanted to eat them, um, you know, in the lunchroom they didn't, but now they're eating them through the day. Next slide, the house. So um, this also has a lot of impacts um, doing this. It allows students to volunteer in the cafeteria. Um, we have a lot of students uh, in the elementary school, the fifth graders that are helping the younger students um, how to um food recover. Um, you know, it has to be unopened, unwrapped. Um, it can't be anything from home that was uh, made by mom and put in a Ziploc bag. So um, we have older students helping our younger students. Um, we also have high school students. We just did one today. We had a high school student come back from her high school. She came back to the elementary school that she, you know, she went to and she also had a younger sister in there and she did a food recovery um, assembly for the students during lunch. This is something we do with each program. We have an assembly during lunch. We explain to all the uh, students how to food recover, why and what the great part of it. Is. So we have students coming back, high school students coming back to the elementary schools to run these programs. Um, help students could offer feedback on the menu items. This is a good thing for, um, for uh, food and nutrition services. If we see these things that are donated are recovered, they're still getting eating, but every time we do it, it's just a lot of it. Maybe we can look at the menu items and say, hey, listen, or we get the students feedback about, hey, we're donating all this stuff because we don't want to eat it because we don't like it in the first place. Um, so maybe that'll cut down. But with all the food be gone by Friday, we, we're not really seeing that feedback because it's still getting eating. Um, and students can learn to organize and donate to nonprofits. What we're learning with these programs is the students are getting very involved in different ways. We have several groups, like I said, that are, are helping us with this um, from student groups, from uh, uh, groups called Compostology to Rise and Shine to uh, Eco Moco students. Um, they're all involved in this um, where they're giving the assemblies, they're making posters. Um, so everything for this program is done by students. Um, everything that we have done um, mostly is is done by the students, um, so student organizations. Next slide, please. Some other things that does is is cultivate um, the empathy and looking out for others. I didn't really think that this was going to be a part of the program. I didn't really think about it when I introduced this to students, but we really start to see the students um, 
thinking about, hey, don't waste that. You know, there's there's kids out there that don't eat. You know, seven seven thousand um, children in MCPS or MCPS in Montgomery County that go home uh, to food insecure houses. So they're, they're starting to think about this, and you see the empathy coming through. Um, they say, hey, don't throw that away. You know, even something simple. I'm going to walk across the room and put it on a share cart where someone else can uh, partake in it. So it really um, shows that the students are, uh, you know, starting to think of each other, and it helps them kind of realize that not everyone goes home to a full refrigerator um, every day. Um, it promotes food conservation and respect um, for greenhouse gases. It, so they start understanding how much food is wasted. Um, a lot of times, you know, it makes them think, well, instead of just taking, I don't really want this, I'll take one bite and throw it away or whatever. It makes them kind of think, well, if I really don't want it before I just take that one bite and throw it away, maybe I can, you know, put it on a share table or the refrigerator um, for someone else can enjoy it. So it's kind of teaching them that too, um, about the, you know, the promotion of, of food conservation. Um, it's not just waste. We're in a kind of a throwaway society. Um, a lot of kids just take it and throw it away. Um, next thing is engage students and learning where their food comes from. I'm getting a lot of questions from students like, um, you know, why is this on our menu? Is this, you know, then we can start talking about our farm, our farm to the table, um, uh, programs and some of our other programs and it kind of gives a good food literacy um i think a lot of students are, are don't realize where their food comes like they see a carrot they don't know it gets pulled out of the ground they just go to the store and there it is so it gives them kind of a good idea uh, of what um their food is coming from and they start learning how valuable it is and what it takes um food waste is a huge um uh, problem for the environment we start to explain to them that if you take a three acre farm you're you're cutting down all the trees, then you're planting it, you're, you're watering it, you're transporting it and taking all that. And then when you throw it away, it has zero waste, used all that, you know, energy and all the greenhouse gases and all that, you know, stuff to produce this food and we're just throwing it away. Um, and so you're just, you know, it has such a, a, a diverse impact on the community and on our earth about just throwing food away that took so much um, effort and, and energy to make. Next slide. So these are some of the other programs that we're doing. Um, this is something new that we started is beautification projects. Um, we hired a new person called a live infrastructure manager, and he's putting together some of these projects. So some of the things you see, we've been planting trees. Um, can, you, Carl, can you help me on this? How many trees that they're planting this year? I think it's like 1,800. I'm not so, sure. Yes, yeah, so over a, a thousand trees in the fall and the spring at different schools um, all over the county. And so we're doing them, uh, we're working with some gardens, um, some master gardeners to break gardens environments in some of our schools. Um, as you can see on November 1st um, from 932, we have a student environmental volunteer day. We're going to have tons of students out there and um, planting native plants and, and, and uh, non-invasive plants and, and cleaning up um, Gaithersburg High School and the park area around it. Um, these are something that we're going to do all over our county. Um, we have some other um, things that are planning. We have a um, a big project what we're um, leading to um, in Lorderman um, Middle School, making a community farm out of that where we could have um, students come and learn how to farm, can learn how composting works. Um, they can learn a lot of things. We also can have a farmer's market on there, outdoor classrooms on there. So this is a project we met with a lot of the community, um, you know, people um, from you know, Eldridge's office down, um, working on this project with Habitat Humanity, um, so many other partners. Um, sorry, I'm in my office too long, the lights went out. Um, <laughs> but we're working on these projects to help beautificate uh, our property that we have, not just have it just sit in there and waste it, we can use it um, not only for beautification, for also learning environments for our students. Next slide, please. So Daniela, you want to talk about packing lunches for your students? Yes, thank you. Hello, John, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm so excited that we'll get to share the information that um, your department does with all the school district. Um, as a mom of two kids in the elementary school system and as a volunteer for the Sustainability and Green School Subcommittee of the MCCPTA, I'd like to share you some, um, some tips. So if your kids eat the school every day, you already know about all the good news that John shared. In addition, he's also helping a school start with the composting program. So I'm gonna share one of a couple of the things that I thought they were most obvious. I only been in the school system for a little bit more than a year. 
Then one thing that I found great, John, is that if you go to this website that I put on the chat and it's also in the presentation, um, at any given time, parents can know what the launch is going to be. And it's the same in every single school. And I thought that was amazing because then you can know in advance if your kid has certain food allergy or just he's very reluctant to eat certain kind of food and you are investing on the food launch, you know, it does cost money to you. If it does, you want to, you know, make the most of it and just not spend that money and just send with your kid a sandwich or something that he's actually going to eat because it's also going to help them be more um, lively, active throughout the day. Now, some kids do receive lunch every day in the schools, and so this might not apply to them. But for those that do have the option to pack something, you know, um, or they're not buying, I'm just gonna share, for example, in our family, um, we have a limited budget for school lunch, but we tell our kids that they're allowed to eat school lunch once a week. So they look at the week and they see what's their favorite day, and then we pack lunch for the next days. So um, I just wanted to share this resource first because that's the first step is like to prevent um, waste is just to not, not waste it on the first place, right? So if we can go to the next slide, I'll share a couple of the options that I've seen in the, in out there in the market. You really don't need to go fancy to make a reusable container be the, the, the vessel in which your kid takes lunch. But some uh, options are, you know, they're out there for every single budget. Like you can even use any kind of uh, food container that you already use for your food uh, storage at home and just put it on a lunchbox. I found that incredibly useful because when my kids come back to school, I can physically see what they didn't eat and that um, gets composted in our house. So I really get intense about these issues and we have a little log where we have like, I make them write down, you know, what they didn't eat. And that way we can reflect at the end of the month, kind of like a little competition between our two children and the, the one that made the best to eat their lunch, um, you know, kind of wins a little prize. The other thing I will say is that uh, it's important to label your lunchbox with the name of your kid, same as the water bottle so that they won't get lost. Um, and the most important thing I want to share with this slide is that in my experience, parents tend to give too much food to the children that they do not have the time to eat. So if you're doing that, maybe you can have a conversation with your kid when you bring a reusable container about what they like, what they didn't like, what happened that day. It has worked wonders for us. And you know, we just use whatever lunch um, container we have. Uh, can we go to the next? Well, well, yeah, to the next slide, please. Um, basically, the one thing that um, I like to emphasize is that as we're starting to divert food waste out of, our, of the landfill for the entire school district, if you pack your food individually in little plastic containers that are disposable, it takes a lot of time for those little hands to separate all that food, and they're more likely going to put it on the compost bin, so you're not going to be able to see what your kid ate or didn't or didn't eat. So my recommendation is to just use any kind of reusable container. Um, and that can also save significant amount of money in every single household because those disposable bags do cost money and you know it adds up when you look at the whole school year. Um they tend to just throw them in the trash, food and everything in, included. Danielle, um, can I can I cut in for a second? Um so when packing lunch, you're talking about disposable and reusable. Um, so yes, yeah, so in Montgomery County, plastic bags are not recyclable in Montgomery County. So that's something that we're not able to do at our schools. We have to throw them away. Some other things too, is we want to look at is if we buy juice boxes or juice bags, the boxes can be recycled if we do use them compared to the bags that have to be thrown away. So we kind of want to keep that um, when we're out buying um, stuff for our uh, students' lunch, keep that in mind that we want to kind of put it in stuff that if um, it doesn't get brought back home, it would be a recycled product in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, maybe we, we can go to the next slide. Um, so in a nutshell, if you label your kids' containers, you know, um, that's a great advice. One thing that I would like to um, encourage you is to use reusable containers 
Um, and one thing that has helped us tremendously in our, our home is when we go do the grocery shopping for the week or, um, you know, the next couple of weeks, we let them choose a veggie and a fruit because that way they feel like they have some agency and it will be more likely completely eaten. This is one of their choice when they're making their lunch. I also prepare the lunchbox with them together so that um, they're involved in it and they we, we are better at nailing the right portions that way. And then when they come back home, before they can do anything else, they wash their lunchboxes as they wash their hands. So that way we get to have a sneak peek of the lunchbox and what is it that it's in the lunchbox that they ate or they didn't eat. So at home, um, sometimes, you know, if the food is in good condition before they have anything else, they first have their leftover snack um, from the lunch that they didn't eat. Uh, it's really a good conversation starter. I just want to highly recommend these tips to everyone. And if you have any more questions, please um, don't hesitate to contact us in the committee. Um, there are plenty of good advices online about these things. There are many, you know, webinars and posts of many kind in Pinterest, for example. Um, now I'll just mention very briefly what are some of the impacts that um, are coming in the next slide. Um, so food waste um, does have a significant impact. I feel like John did a great job as uh, touching base on this, but we're just gonna reinforce four of, of the main things that we can improve by preventing food waste. And the first one will be, um, food insecurity. In Montgomery County, uh, we are lucky enough to live in the agricultural reserve, which used to feed, you know, Washington DC and the, a big part of the county. But as we have changed the uses of the agricultural reserve, we don't produce enough food in our region to feed our population. So a lot of the food that we are currently eating at our schools and in our houses in general comes from very far away. That's what it's called food miles. And so by reducing the food waste in your lunchbox and by composting as the school district is doing, all of that food waste is going to be reincorporated um, as organic amendments for the local soil, which is benefiting the local farmers that are making our food system more secure. Um, maybe we can go to the next point uh, now. And so, with this, we're fostering productivity because there is less transportation from those foods that are being um, generated for feeding the kids. And it's also more efficient economically. It's good for the farmers to have a steady uh, demand and it's good for, um, for the district in general. It's also educating the kids about where their food comes from. Um, maybe next point. So with these, um, the food waste prevention program that the district is uh, starting is really a good complement to all the other energy conservation efforts. And it's reducing significantly the amount of greenhouse gases that um, the district is producing because once that they install food waste diversion programs in the schools, um, you know, not only they can reduce in more than half the percentage of waste that they're producing, but by not generating food waste in the first place, we are reducing the food insecurity of the kids. We're getting better, more active, nourished, happy kids. And we're also conserving energy in all of those parts of the chain that um, you know were not produced in vain. Yes, last point, please. Um, as I mentioned, this addresses climate change. As we speak, most of the 220 schools food waste is currently being incinerated. And that kind of a, it's like, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot because all of those side effects are coming back and getting all our kids right now. Um, you know, we have an incinerator right here, less than six miles from our schools in the, in the agricultural reserve. And I'm sure wherever you live in the district, this is my, might be also an issue. So by just packing your lunch mindfully and by volunteering in any of these efforts that reduce food waste in the school district, you are really making a big dent in uh, climate action. Thank you. All right, it is my turn. My name is Giancarlo Rodriguez. I work with John uh, in the Division of Sustainability and Compliance. Uh, my role is uh, a facilitator. So I go out to schools to um, 
do outreach with the students. I, I meet with principals, I meet with PTAs, um, with the students themselves uh, to, so that they can learn about uh, uh, MCPS sustainability. I also do some uh, behind the scenes investigations on energy use or water use that may be abnormal and try to find out why it's happening uh, so that our division of maintenance and operations can take care of the problem. Uh, but one of the roles that I do as well is the Maryland Green School Program certification. I help schools advise them on how to become uh, Maryland certified green schools. So, <clears throat> so a little background, uh, uh, the uh, Maryland Association for Environmental Outdoor Educators uh, which is called uh, acronym MAO, is, was founded in 1999. They administer the Green School program uh, for the state of Maryland. Um, and in 1999, Rocky Hill Middle School was the first MCPS to become a Mar Maryland certified green school. In 2003, Outdoor Ed, which is the uh, Smith Center, became a certified green center, um, which is a little different than a green school. Um, and then in 2012, the Division of Sustainability, um, the CERT program became a green center. So um, like John said earlier in this in the presentation, in June 2022, uh, uh, Montgomery County Board of Ed adopted the sustainability policy to tie into the goals of the uh, Montgomery County government's climate action plan. Um, one of the strategies was to develop uh, more uh, develop and uh, to increase the number of green schools that are uh, certified. Um, the goal of Maryland Green Schools is to be 50% by, by 2024 and 100% by 2035. Um, currently, we have 96 schools that are Mar Maryland certified green schools, which is currently 45%. So, um, and we need everybody's help to get to that goal. Uh, so, we have green centers that can help. Uh, the Division of Sustainability is a green center. Outdoor Ed is a green center. Black Hill, uh, Brookside, and Meadowside Nature Centers are uh, green centers for Montgomery Parks. And then external would be uh, the Nature Forward, which was used to be the Audubon Society. They're also an external partner that helps schools become green schools. So. Why should a school become a green school? So what they want is they want to get the students to get hands on out and out, getting their hands dirty, so to speak, to enrich their education um, so that they, they question their environment. They say, why is this like this? Why is that like that? You know, when, when they're in, inside in the classroom, they're learning about let's say uh, butterflies and migration patterns, but it's a lot better if they go outside and they have a pollinator garden and they actually see the butterflies um, from the caterpillar to the butterfly and they learn about it by, by doing investigations. So the reason is this is gonna empower the youth to, um, to take that knowledge back home and to their communities and to, to foster that environmental sustainability. And then the, cer the certification occurs every four years. So that is to reinforce the students that have already gone through the process. And as new students come into the, into the system, they learn about it. Um, and then the students will take this from the elementary to the middle, to the high school, to the college, and eventually into the workforce uh, to, to have a more sustainable future. Um, so this just came out this year. It's a study from... Uh, the Notre Dame University of Maryland, um, uh, they actually looked at green schools um, and said, okay, so these schools are becoming green schools. Is it actually having an impact on students? So one of the conclusions they came up with was that the focus on environmental concepts, practices, and curricula to which green schools commit uh, seems to result in relatively higher science achievements scores than schools without green school status. So, so the aspect of, of going out, like I said earlier, into the, into, into the, into nature, um, is helping students achieve higher test scores. Um, uh, this is a preliminary st uh, study. It hasn't been peer reviewed, but, um, it seems like, like it's, uh, it's a good thing. They've looked at to see if, 
schools with far high farms, Title I, uh, wealthier schools, if, if there was an impact, a difference in impact. And then across the board, it seems like if they're a green school, their test scores in science are a little bit higher. All right. So um, the Green Sp uh, Schools portal is looks like this. Um, you can go to it and see if your school is a green school or um, what the process looks like. And the process has three objectives, um, which are uh, objective one is uh, systemic sustainability. Objective two is sustainability practices and objective three is community partnerships. Um, there are some deadlines and some other things that are kind of the behind the scenes, uh, but basically that's it. So objective one is staff driven. What are the what are the staff doing at the school to instruct the students uh, on sustainability? So typically you need um, two pieces of examples from each grade on uh, curriculum and instruction, for example, uh, Kindergarten learned about the weather and then went outside and they they tracked the clouds or they looked at clouds or drew pictures of clouds. Or fifth grade art did art with recycled materials. Um, then there's some professional development that the teachers have to do uh, and some uh, sustainable school-wide behaviors and some celebrations. And that's basically it for for the for objective one. You just we just have to document it with a picture and a little caption and a person at the school would be who's filling out the application would be coordinating all of this. And then objective two is student driven. So this is where they want to see the students getting their hands dirty. So they want to see students conserving water or conserving uh, electricity or increasing the recycling at their school or at home or in the community, um, restoring habitat. Uh, you know, so, you know, we have schools that have a forest conservation area on on site. You know, uh, them getting out there and seeing what's what kind of plants are there? Are they invasive? Um, are they? Is it overgrown? Is, are the trees dying? Um, structures for environmental environmental learning would be like outdoor classrooms. Are they using the outdoor classrooms? Um, uh, responsible transportation. Are they doing the walk to school, which is coming up soon? Uh, healthy school environment. Are they taking care of uh, plants at the school? Some schools have plants. I know there's an elementary school that has a little terrarium where they have a bunnies and a turtle. Um, uh, and and for the older grades, um, community science and and citizen science, there are some online tools that students would yet would use to to calculate what their footprint is and other other activities. So they want to see the students getting out and advocating and doing different activities for these uh, eight categories. So there's de definitely some examples here for each one. And then objective three is community partnerships. That, those community partnerships where the school is active in the community and the community is active in the school. So for example, PTA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Um, if uh, we've had schools collect items for a refugee camp from the Ukraine war, um, we've had students uh, collect items for a sister school uh, you know, some some uh, some supplies for sister school or, or or jackets or bikes. We've had schools do that. Um, we've also had schools receive those things from other schools and other community partnerships. Um, the uh, the the student organizations f food recovery is a great example of this. We we have the student organization that is working with schools to help them recover the food. Um, so those are some of the things. And then that's that's basically it. So um, how do how do how does the Division of Sustainability and MCC PTA uh, know what what you want for your school, what your students want for your for their school? Is there's actually we have a, a form that all schools have to fill out. It's called the Sustainability Action Plan. Um, and on there they have different different things where they can say, I'm interested in this. I'm interested in that. I need this. This is the person you need to talk to. These are the students that are at this high school that have this environmental club and they're interested in that. And all schools have to fill this out. And currently um, 
we only have 60 schools around 60 schools that have submitted it in so if you if you if you see your principal um or if you work at a school check with them to see if, if they have submitted it yet because this is the best way that we can reach out to the correct person and and get that information out to them and then we can find these partnerships that we can work with and and get out there and and and, and get moving on what students students want uh more action on sustainability uh, but first we need this in this form um so and right there um on that form would be the food waste coordinator name and that goes to john and john would reach out to that person the sustainability team leader name would uh would come to me and i would reach out to that person uh school recycling coordinator a little bit above john would take care of that and then we can always uh reach out to students anytime and talk to them about anything that they uh they that they need and uh any of the parents here if you have any questions about sustainability, please feel free uh, to reach out to us. We're always available. You know, our goal is to make our, our system not only sustainable, uh, to make our system sustainable, not only for the planet, but for, you know, our limited resources, whether that's time, money, or uh, uh, resources that are, um, that, that are available to us. Because, you know, we live in a finite world and then we need, we need to, um, to do a better job for our students, for the for the kids. So um, here's some contact information and I'll leave it up. And if anybody, John or um, Danielle, you wanna say anything else? Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm done, thank you so much. So um, on that sustainability action form, you see team members, parents can be team members for this if they want to be involved in their school's green club or their school sustainability plan. Um, they're more than welcome to join um, the, the school sustainability plan. Just you know, go to your school and say, I want to be one of the members of the program and, and they can add you out to, on to that. And we'll also feed, follow all the information that we're sending out to school. We also can include you on that. Thank you. Danielle. Gracias. Mm -hmm. I, I it's such an exciting journey to be part of the volunteer team for the MCCPTA Sustainability and Green Schools. We meet the fourth Thursday of the month. Even if you don't know how much you want to get involved with your school, I invite you to email Joanna Snyder and come to one of our meetings on Zoom. You're normally when kids go to bed just from 8 to 9 p.m. And we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Every school is in a different uh, place. So the nice thing about John's team and our, our super committee is that we meet you where you are and we help you to go to your next step. So thank you so much. Please share this information on the presentation. I think that will be a first step with other people on your PTA and that's the way to uh, get it started. In our school, for instance, um, we're gonna try to get a green team started for the parents. Thank you very much. <laughs>